say welcome to to our video audience my name is Sherwin and uh, we do have live services here at 9 and 11 every Sunday morning so just out of curiosity how many of you know what a goat roper is oh well, got one maybe two well you know that my background is in beef production I grew up on this farm that had between six and seven hundred head of cattle all the time. A hundred yards from my bedroom window were cattle yards when I was growing up. So you can say that as a teenager, I pretty much was in with cattle every day. I fed them, I made sure they could get up in the morning so that you know they wouldn't bloat and kill themselves. I understood all about cattle and pretty much everything there was to know. Now in Northwest Iowa, where I grew up, People don't like to be called cowboys. You know, cowboys are kind of, you know, they're the people from the west, further west, that, that raise the calves that we would buy and then feed them because we had the corn to feed the, the cattle to, you know, turn them into hamburgers and steaks. The, but, you know, I, I thought about that too as, as growing up. Well, I was a real cowboy because I was around cattle all the time. Now the urban or the suburban cowboy is what the western cowboys, and especially when I was living in Oklahoma, these are the ones called goat ropers, okay? The typical goat roper is a city dweller or a suburbanite who has a pickup truck, wears cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, probably chews tobacco, but doesn't know the difference between a heifer and a steer. And I had to explain that too. I found out in the first service, a lot of folks don't know the difference between a heifer and a steer. A heifer is a cow that has not yet had a calf, and a steer is a neutered male. Now, we call these people posers that pretend to be cowboys and don't know anything about it. Or as I found my goat roper hat, or as they say, somebody who uh, is all hat and no cattle. And that's kind of how that works. Now, the term goat roper, I probably messed my hair up and that'd be terrible. Um, a goat roper, there's actually a rodeo event in the Little Britches Rodeo Association that I saw as a kid where you would rope goats instead of cattle. And these little kids come out in their Shetland ponies and try to rope them, you know, but goats are smarter than cows. They, you can rope them once and then they just stand there because they don't like to be jerked around by the rope. So they, uh, that didn't work too well. But yeah, a goat roper is uh, somebody who pretends to be a cowboy. And when I lived in Oklahoma, one of the greetings that you got was, hey there, goat roper. It was just kind of a, you know, how men insult each other when they greet. It was just one of those things. But a poser is someone who pretends to be something he is not. And we are all goat ropers to a degree. You know, it just happens that way. To be human is to be hypocritical. And we're all hypocrites in some way on a scale of one to 10. I always say, let's just rank our hypocrisy. It's not if we are hypocritical, it's how hypocritical we are. If we, today we're gonna to take a look at the hypocrisy of one of Jesus' disciples, the hypocrisy of Peter, who was kind of the, the head honcho of the disciple group. He was one of Jesus' disciples, one of his students, who constantly got in trouble for shooting off his mouth. He was a loud one. He liked to order others around, but he had this desire to please. Now, no doubt he had this desire to please, but he was also driven by a desire to be a big shot. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 2 today. It's a story told from Paul's perspective of how he had to confront Peter because Peter was doing some nasty things. That's going to take a little concentration, but you can do it. I suggest you take notes on this. A little background here is that Paul taught that in Christ you are free. You don't have to worry about all the rules. You don't have to worry about all these regulations. 
all these religious laws. The only law you have is the law of love. And some of the Jewish converts had a real problem with that. The first generation of followers of Jesus all came from Jewish backgrounds where they had all kinds of rules. And here comes Paul, who was a, a Jewish leader before he became a Christian, saying, you could throw all those laws out now. And some of them didn't like that. Some of them said, to be a good Christian, you also have to be a good Jew, which meant you had to eat kosher. No more bacon, no more shrimp, no more lobster. You had to eat only what was kosher, and you had to observe the Sabbath, which was Saturday. No work on Saturday whatsoever. Couldn't even light a fire in your own house. You had to hire a non-Jewish person to come in and light your fire if it went out. No work at all. And, of course, if you were a guy, you had to submit to a little surgery. You had to be circumcised, which took quite a bit of dedication, I'm guessing. And these people followed Paul around, trying to undo his teaching. And it took us centuries to get past this. Galatians 2 records an argument between Paul and Peter. Peter came to Antioch and did some things that just really ticked Paul off. So Paul had a conversation with him, and it's told from Paul's point of view, and I'm gonna read this to you from uh, Galatians chapter two. Later, when Peter came to Antioch, I had a face-to-face -face confrontation with him because he was clearly out of line. Here's the situation. Earlier, before certain persons had come from James, Peter regularly ate with the non-Jews. But when that conservative group came from Jerusalem, he cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between himself and his non-Jewish friends. See, Jews were not allowed to even enter the house of a non-Jew. They were not allowed to eat with them because they had to stay pure. Now, Peter had changed because of Jesus. But he was afraid of this conservative group from Jerusalem. He wanted their approval. Now, later on, Peter had a vision, which is recorded for us in Acts chapter 10, of he's, he's sleeping on this rooftop, and a sheet is let down from heaven with all these unkosher animals on them, all these animals that were prohibited for Jews to eat, like lobsters and pigs and whatnot. And he's told, go ahead and eat them. And he argues, but finally he gives in and does what he's supposed to do. And he says, well, in this vision, God was telling him, no, you, you can't isolate yourself from those people who are not Jews. You have to accept them all. And that was in his vision, but he hadn't had that yet at this point. So the passage goes on like this. That's how fearful he was of the conservative Jewish clique that's been pushing the old system of circumcision. Unfortunately, the rest of the Jews in Antioch, in the Antioch church, joined in that hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was swept along in the charade. See, Paul had started this church in Antioch, which is now in, in Turkey, and um, we figure by the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, the late 300s, early 400s, there were 100,000 Christians in Antioch. So it had spread like wildfire. Now what's ironic about Antioch is it, you can see on this map here, it's got a different name now, Antica or something. It's 500 miles north of Jerusalem. Now these guys came all the way from Jerusalem to straighten things out, to contradict Paul. 500 miles. They had no internal combustion engines. Today, you can travel that highway that's in blue on there, and it takes you 10 hours by car. The speed limit is 100 kilometers per hour, which is about 62 miles an hour. You can do it by 10 hours, according to Google Maps. And it's uh, an interesting place, that highway there that's in blue, until 2014 was controlled by Syrian rebels. U.S. and British forces forced them out of the area, so the highway's open now again. Just some trivia that you might like to know. So you can see how these people were so dedicated 
to put an end to the teaching of Paul. That they would travel, most likely by boat, I would guess, all the way up to Antioch just to put an end to what Paul was teaching. And they were so persuasive that they got this fellow named Barnabas to go along with them. And Barnabas was known for his generosity. He's called, you know, the son of comfort, the son of encouragement, because he helped so many people. They even talked him into going along with this, this kind of teaching, in spite of the fact that he was really kind and generous. So it was a mess. Here's Paul's further comments on it. But when I saw they were not maintaining a steady, straight course according to the message, I spoke up to Peter in front of them all. If you, a Jew, live like a non-Jew when you're not being observed by the watchdogs from Jerusalem, what right do you have to require non-Jews to conform to Jewish customs just to make a favorable impression on your old Jerusalem buddies? Uh, here we see the crux of the problem of most religion. You know, the rules are made by religious leaders just for showing off. If I can make up some rules and follow them and you can't, that makes me better than you. You know, me big, you little, that sort of thing. And that's what they were thinking of. It has nothing to do with following Jesus. The rules were there to make the leaders look good. And then Paul goes on, he says this, we Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule keeping, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. How do we know? We tried it and we had the best system of rules the world has ever seen. This is a really profound paragraph here. It's the heart of what Paul teaches. You see what I've got highlighted there. We're not set right with God by rule keeping, but only by personal faith in Jesus. Rules are not what makes us right with God. He goes on. Convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement, we believed in Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah not by trying to be good. Again, this is utterly profound. This is the core of the gospel. It's going to hurt the self-improvement book market if it's taken seriously. But he's saying you can't please God by self-improvement. You can only please God by trusting in Jesus to save you. Very basic stuff. But it is the heart of Christianity. And then the next paragraph, I think you can see Paul saying this kind of with a smirk on his face. He says, have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? No great surprise, right? Are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me who go through Christ in order to get things right with God aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin? The accusation is frivolous. If I was trying to be good... I'd be rebuilding the same old barn that I tore down. I would be acting as a pretender. See, trying to follow the rules doesn't work because you can't follow the rules. As Paul says, it'd be like rebuilding the same old barn. If you're trying to be saved by following the rules, that makes you a pretender. That makes you a poser. That makes you a religious goat roper. It can't be done. Paul goes on with this. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping the rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. You know, what he's saying here is that this tremendous ego that he had, the tremendous ego that we all have, can be crucified with Christ. It's gone. He goes on with this. He says, my ego is no longer central. It's no longer important that I appear righteous before you 
or have your good opinion. And I'm no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to go back on that. See what he's saying here? You don't have to impress anyone, not even God. Now, how cool is that? We're here to bless, not impress. It's just a cool part of the heart of the gospel. I'm kind of glad that Paul had this little fight with Peter here. Because things got explained that are going to last us for all eternity. He says this, it's not clear to you to go back to that old rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God. I refuse to do that, to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule-keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. See, so if I go back to rule-keeping, peer-pleasing, trying to please other people with my religion, I'm abandoning my salvation. It's like taking Jesus and dumping him out. It, it's a, not a good idea. See, and he says, if that religion of all the rules worked, then Christ died unnecessarily. You know, then we're saved by following rules, not by what Jesus did. And we can all breathe a sigh of relief and say, thank God that didn't work. What I've observed in my nearly 40 years now is that the more rules there are, the more hypocrisy there is. So you've got to watch out for those who like the rules. Jesus called that the yeast of the Pharisees. Religious rules produce posers. Pastors who like rules are like wolves in sheep's clothing. So stop trying to be good. Yeah, you can quote me on that. That crazy pastor from Laketon Bethel says, stop trying to be good and follow Jesus instead. It's a much better way. And you'll be much happier. Peter ate with the non-Jews until the Jews came to town. They're most likely referring to the Lord's Supper. See, the rule keepers like to keep people out, to exclude people because it makes them look superior. If I can exclude you, I'm better than you. See, and that's what Paul said, "Uh uh-uh, you can't do that. The posers in the pulpit like to exclude people for various sins as a deflection of their own. See, if I can make up a bunch of rules and show you how you're breaking those rules, you're not going to see the fact that I break a lot of rules. And they get really defensive about it. Goat ropers live in constant fear that somebody's going to find out they're not a real cowboy. But the rules are for show. They don't gain you points with God at all. Jesus invites everybody, even us black sheep. And pretty much all of us are black sheep. He invites us all. He died to pay the ransom for us all. So you need to do the same. And in doing so, you will be much happier We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper now, so I'm going to say goodbye to our video audience. Thanks, as always, thanks for listening.